Professor Brain Brown's research shows that vulnerability fosters good emotional and mental health. It is a sign of courage. We become more resilient and brave when we embrace who we truly are and what we are feeling. The Vulnerable Scientist Podcast is a space for scientists to tell their honest and authentic stories. I am your host, Sarah Nyakeri, who happens to be a scientist, informal science communicator, and I help scientists create personal websites. If you want to support this show, go to www.patreon.com slash the vulnerable scientist. You can also follow this podcast on all social media platforms at TV Scientist Pod. Hi again, welcome to the Vulnerable Scientist Podcast. This is your host, Sarah Nyakeri. And in this part, this is part four of Dr. Laura's story. And she, in this part, she is telling her story of how, um, of the highs and lows that she points out that she didn't like mention in the previous episodes. And the, and the hope is that she has, and yeah, it's generally just the last part of the, um, discussion and the, actually the, the, the main part of the podcast. So I hope you enjoy listening to this. What you'll notice that at, at some point you'll see there's a repetition and that is because, um, the, the first day that we are recording this, we got, um, time, you know, was not on our side. So we stopped the recording and uh, we started re-recording, re-recording, re-recording another day. So. Yeah, you you can skip or you can still feel to see another perspective of how she talks about her story in different um, ways, especially the highs um, and the and the hobbies. So um, yeah, that's it. Enjoy. So at this point, we've talked about a lot about your story, um, like pretty much your journey. And uh, it's a very long and interesting journey that has, like, it's it's so different. Like, it has all these things going on. And you've mentioned some lows and highs while at it, while you're still having that conversation, though you didn't say this is a low, is a high. But um, I would like to for you to maybe uh, tell us the lows that you have not talked about that we'd like to have to talk about for the remaining time. I'm not one who tends to like to talk about the lows. I'm much more of a optimist, you know. <laughs> the lows get you to a high eventually, is yeah. how I look at it. Um, I mean, some of the harder times in my life was when I had to quit the fake or failed PhD. PhD. Mm. Um, I, I literally had depression. And mm. didn't feel comfortable in myself, didn't feel comfortable with my family. I just, I felt like a failure. Mm. And it was interesting what got me out of that. Because Mm. when I went to teaching, Mm. and I was teaching those really basic how not to kill yourself classes, Mm. I was constantly teaching people about the benefits of exercise, Mm. the benefits of eating right, and Mm. the benefits of meditation. And it dawned on me one day well, here I am, and I'm, I'm telling all these students that these things help with depression. Mm. I've identified I am depressed, mm. but I am not doing any of these things. Mm-hmm. Why am I not doing any of these things? Mm-hmm. And so I started at that point to put an emphasis on mostly exercise, because that was the biggest thing that was lacking, and endorphins are released, and those are your feel-good hormones. So, I mean, biologically, it made sense. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I put my two kids on the back of my bicycle, and Mm -hmm. I started riding them almost every day up to the local park, which for me is about three miles away. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember the first time I did this very clearly, because I live in an area that can be rather hilly, Mm -hmm. and I had no experience. Like, I had no stamina riding a bicycle any distance. So I'm on my way back. I'm going up this really big hill. I've got, you know, 100 pounds I'm towing in the back with kids and trailer and that sort. Mm -hmm. And I'm about ready to die. Mm -hmm. And my oldest kid, who's like five at the time, yells from the back, Hey, Mom, can't you go any faster? What? (laughs) And I looked at her and I said, Yeah, if you got out and you walked. (laughs) And... (laughs) That was just motivation for me to, okay, I'm going to do this again until I can make it up this hill without having to walk it. 
And then the fall came around, and in my area, we get a lot of snow. Mm. So I knew I had to go inside. Mm. And so I went to the local gym, and mm. I got a membership. Mm -hmm. And the membership came with three free sessions with a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. So here comes this lady. Her name is Ashley. Mm. And she sees, okay, well, Laura, you used to be on the swim team when you were eight years old. And I'm looking at her going, yeah, I almost drowned. Wow. And then she goes, well, it looks like you've been riding your bicycle all summer. Yeah, but my kids say I'm slow and I'm walking all the time. And she mm. looks at she goes, well, if we can teach you how to run, you can do a triathlon. What is that? And I stop. And I'm like, a triathlon? Mm. You want me to swim, bike, and run all at the same time? Are you mm. crazy? Mm. And she goes, no. She goes... There's one that's a short one in nine months. We can have you ready for that. And I am thinking she's crazy. Mm. So I go home and I think about this for three weeks. Mm. And I finally said, okay, I'll try it. Mm. And so they put me in a running 101 class where you ran from mailbox to mailbox. And you mm. walked in between mailbox to mailbox. And mm. eventually you went every other mailbox and every third mailbox. Mm. And a few months later, my oldest daughter um, decided to join Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I made a deal with her that if she got higher than white belt, that I would join. Mm. And that then led to me getting a first degree black belt, a second degree black belt, wow. a third degree black belt. She was in the dojo alongside me, got her first degree. She quit earlier than I did. Mm. Um, I ended up going on to do Olympic distance triathlons. I've run two marathons. Um, and this is all something that I never ran a quarter of a mile before I was 35. Mm. But I started doing it simply because I was depressed and mm. I was tired of being depressed. Mm. Wow. Okay. So, um, at this moment, uh, Laura, I, I think we we are starting this recording at a point where it's another day, so it's a bit. <laughs> we're probably not in that space as much. Um, Correct. But uh, previously, you were talking about you had talked about your journey and how you got to where you are right now. Um, in the startup company that does yes. some, something to do with neuro computation and doing designing drugs for um com computational side of designing drugs before going to the bench side of it right um basically yes <laughs> yeah yeah so um I, I would like to know what are the lows i like to start the lows unless you want to start the highs well what are the challenges that you faced either personal or that have has affected your career in one way or another or to do with your son's career how, what are the laws that you hadn't mentioned before that you have faced and or you'd like to talk more about um well i think i covered quite a bit of my lows already mm. uh, particularly talking about you know being a scientist in a PhD program as a new mom, and then uh, being a scientist with young children uh, and, you know, teaching and all of that. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I'm not one who generally likes to dwell on the negatives, so I, mm. I think I've covered the lows enough. Okay. So let's talk about the highs then. Tell, tell us about the positive things that you hadn't mentioned. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's interesting to reflect on that because mm -hmm. they build over time. And I like to celebrate the small wins. Mm -hmm. it keeps you motivated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember when Michael Harani did his first poster. And how excited we were uh, going down to University of Michigan and, and mm. presenting there. Mm -hmm. And then I can remember the first time I had multiple students presenting mm. posters at the same conference. 
and mm. how exciting that was. Yeah. And I try to always like build on what's been done before. So, you know, if I publish, you know, two or three papers last year, mm. then this year I would want to publish an equal number or more, maybe in better journals, for example. So, you know, always improving, um, but always celebrating those, those small wins as you go. Mm. Our lab at Davenport, um, the Harris Interdisciplinary Research Group, we used to have regular get-togethers after conferences mm -hmm. where, you know, we would go present and then afterwards we would go to, you know, someplace and get a beer. Mm. And of course, as the principal investigator, I was usually the one buying at least the first round of the beer. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, it, it helped with camaraderie. It helped people stay motivated. And, you know, the students grew and did posters that became published papers. Mm -hmm. um, Amber Park, uh, one of our uh, better students, she was like presenting at um, national competitions. And I remember her winning third place and how excited everyone was, mm -hmm. you know, myself included. Um, so I really like celebrating the, those successes as they go. Mm. Myself personally, I mean, I remember when I won uh, the Excellence in Teaching Award from Davenport University. Mm -hmm. And that's one of three awards that they give out to any faculty member, part-time, full-time, doesn't matter what department, mm -hmm. every year. So it was wow. a huge deal to get this award mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, walking through the crowd after listening to the students that had nominated me and what they had said. Mm -hmm. And it coincided with my uh, student Kawana getting student commencement speaker mm -hmm. and her and I were about to go to D.C. and present together in a few months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything is always building and and you know, their successes become my successes and vice versa. Yeah. No, oh, that's exciting. How is it? How, I don't know. What, what is that feeling when you see your student or someone you've mentored um, get something like uh, excelling in something, either small win or win? What is that feeling apart from happiness? Like, what is that feeling that you get? It's hard to describe, really, mm. but it's a different type of pride than when it's something you get yourself. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, when I get an award myself, I am a bit shy. Mm. I mean, I'll go up and accept the award, and if I need to give a speech or what have you, I can do that. Mm. But, you know, I always kind of feel a bit out of place, almost embarrassed when people are coming up and congratulating me. Mm -hmm. But when it's my student, I'm like standing on the chair yelling, yeah, that's my student. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of you. And I don't care how embarrassing I am. Mm -hmm. I'm just so happy. <laughs> and it's just different, I guess, because the attention's not necessarily on me when they're getting the award, but mm -hmm. I feel like in a way I'm also getting that award because of the role I played in helping them get there. And yeah. they'll usually reflect on that too later on. Mm -hmm. So oh, that's nice. Is there another um, high that you've had that you'd like to talk about? I've had some that were unexpected. Mm hmm so like um, the Lead Like a Woman Award from the Michigan Chamber of Commerce just came out of nowhere. Hmm. And it was a situation where I was very active in my community. And what do you the mean your community? local life. I'm sorry. What do you mean your community? Um, well, like. I'll bring the local elementary school students to my lab at Davenport oh. during Christmas break mm. so they can do dissections oh, wow. because I have leftover hearts from the prior semester that are going to go bad and, and you might as well do something with them. Yeah. Or, you know, going to the kids' school and doing like a whodunit science mystery mm. assembly with them. 
you know, kind of like bringing enrichment to the community yeah. is what I mean by that. Mm. Um, and, and so with that, uh, the local librarian was actually on the committee with the Michigan Chamber of Commerce and was recommending me for this Lead Like a Woman award that I had never heard of, mm. um, knew nothing about, but she thought I would be perfect for it. Mm. Uh, so that was a surprise for me that was a nice you know <laughs> a nice feeling what what um, happened to this um are there any of these kids that are in science some are going in that direction but mm. i've only been doing this kind of outreach for a few years okay. and these kids are young Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I've seen kids get out of, you know, these little enrichment things and go on to do other, you know, computer programming classes, mm -hmm. or they're interested in a medical camp, mm -hmm. or something like that. But where are they going to go? I'm not sure. Because I mean, I saw them when they were eight mm -hmm. years old, maybe, and now yeah. they're 13. <laughs> so give them oh. another five years. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. I had it that, <laughs> but I'm curious to know. I, I wish I, I wish they were older. I would be curious to know how that. I don't experience either not in science or in science impacted their lives in what way. Like I'm, I'm so curious to know that. Like from, it would be nice to know. You know. Um, yeah, for sure. And and know. once in a while, I do get that feedback usually mm -hmm. from my students. Mm -hmm. So like I have a few students um, that were nursing students of mine at Davenport that graduated. Mm -hmm. And then a few years after they graduated, my husband needed a surgery. Mm -hmm. And so it just so happened that the night nurse that took care of him mm -hmm. was a student of oh, mine. What a coincidence. And so... It was awesome. And, you know, the nurse that was doing the surgery anesthesia mm. was a student of oh, mine. Two. Yes. So, you know, that was fun because they had a special relationship with my husband because of me. Mm. Uh, they would tell him he has to behave or they'll tell me about it. <laughs> um, and he would. He knows better. But, um, yeah, I mean, he ended up having a complication and having to go back in. Mm -hmm. And so we recommended the students, you know, to mm -hmm. look after my husband because we knew they were there and he mm -hmm. liked having them. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to kind of get that feedback, you know, that, that roundabout. Yeah. Wow. That's so, like, how, what are the chances that they could be two students? For your husband, it's not like they are in the same institution. They are the ones who actually took care of your husband. Like it's so, it's such a coincidence. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't think so. Um, because oh. of the area that I live in, and oh. how many students that I teach. Okay. So basically, they have two main hospitals in my area, mm -hmm. and the hospitals were so starved for nurses that they had kind of partnered with my college mm. that they would take anyone practically that we would graduate wow. um, that could pass their boards and such. Mm. So I knew that quite a few of my students worked at that hospital. I just didn't expect them to be on the floor or in the mm. operating room. Mm. So it wasn't a surprise, but oh, yeah, okay. I mean. But, but that's nice. I, yeah. Yeah. I also teach like, a hundred students a semester oh, or yeah. I used to anyway. So, you know, that adds up over time. Yeah. So that, that, that probability becomes high. Yes. Oh, okay. Now I get it. Well, that's nice altogether. Um, so what else, what are the high? Yeah, I mean, career wise, that's about it for now. Um, that I can really share more are coming. But, you know, it. there's always the mom highs and, you know, family high and, and that sort of thing, too. So, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? I guess I get the same pride out of my kids 
mm-hmm. and my husband to some extent mm-hmm. that I do out of my students. Mm-hmm. Particularly when like my kids are struggling with something mm-hmm. and I have to help them with it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like my, my oldest right now is struggling in a chemistry lecture. And mm-hmm. so I'm spending a lot of time helping her. Mm-hmm. And when she has those aha moments we talked about last time, yeah, um, yeah it's it, it gets exciting. When, when they win awards, I, I yell out the cheers, too. So, Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Uh, okay, that's great. Um what are the hobbies what are that you have or what are the things that you do first before that you you mentioned that you did swimming earlier on i don't in your before high school or something right oh yes yes and later on you came to do you tried a, a triathlon triathlon yes later yes. on swimming running and something else bicycling yes and cycling yeah so um yeah do you still do swimming competitively or uh not competitively really i mean Uh. i i was a slow triathlete to begin with Mm. um part because i don't have the body build for it and the other part is i don't have the time some mm. people will literally train 12 hours a day. I just, I don't have that time. Oh, okay, okay. Um, not that I really want to, but um, I do enjoy it. Okay. So like uh, my daughters and I will be doing a 5k run walk next weekend for charity. Wow. Um, mm. A few months ago I did um, a 6k or sorry, a 10k, which is six miles as an event, but it wasn't meant to be, you know, like it was competitive, but I wasn't competing really. Oh, okay. So I do it more out of fun um, and to stay healthy now than mm. I do competitively. I used to be way more competitive, but uh, oh. yeah, I still enjoy it. Oh, okay. So h- how do you feel when you're in that place, in that space where you're running and doing all this? Like how, what is that thing? that you feel afterwards because someone might be wondering why are you doing it like how like how how is that fun <laughs> well actually that's what i wonder myself about part way through <laughs> um particularly when i did my marathons i mean when, when blisters start to set in you seriously mm. wonder why am i doing this mm. um which is interesting because as soon as you're done and you get that medal you're like so excited you go up and sign up for the next one right away mm. And then about halfway through the training for it, you again ask your question, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, and I guess the best reason I have come up with is because I can mm. and I should. Mm. So there are a lot of people uh, that I've encountered over the course of my career and my life mm. that, you know, were paraplegic. They can't walk. Mm. And I've watched them do handicap races, Mm -hmm. you know, as a wheelchair bound person. And they've just been so inspirational. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that kind of motivates me, you know, the the cancer kids that I've seen before, they, they would love to go out and just run around the yard, let alone run three miles or 26 miles. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I start to lose motivation for a while, mm. I'll think about people like them. Yeah. And okay, they would want to be me, even though I am struggling right now. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, if it's a long enough race, you just eventually get to the point where you're like, I want this to be done. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it does stop being fun. Mm. But then there's this feeling of, I accomplished something, I triumphed over something. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's kind of what built that part of my life. A lot of it probably came from Taekwondo um, Mm -hmm. and just this always, you've got to improve upon what you did before. Mm -hmm. Um, But in sports for me, eventually that meant uh, either too much time or injuries, hence I'm no longer competitive, but um, Mm -hmm. yeah. The okay. same thing applies to your career, though, to always 
do better than you did before. Yeah, I was about to ask you that. Like, how does that? How do you reflect on that when you when you're pursuing your career? I just say yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you also mentioned that you did taekwondo, and you had a black belt. You have a you have a black belt, right? Yeah, a third degree. So I did it for about eight years. How? What? <laughs> okay. How many degrees are there? Sorry, I don't um, know. Um. Okay. Well, in taekwondo, I think there are nine, mm-hmm. but the ninth one is reserved for the eternal Grandmaster Lee, who was the one who founded the American Taekwondo Association here in the oh. United States. Okay. Now, my master is a seventh degree. He is a senior master. And Mm -hmm. his master is actually an eighth degree, which is the highest you can get and still be alive. Um, And he actually runs the ATA. And so I'm a third degree. If I go any further, I'll have to start teaching and traveling for my my, um, craft. So I've kind of backed out of that also because I already do enough teaching (laughs) in science. I I don't really want to teach Taekwondo, but I have taught a few of those classes too. So in short, you're at the highest level you can be when you're not, you know, actively like giving back the training that you have, right? Correct. Um, To go any further, I would want to open my own dojo, and that is not a goal of mine. Oh, okay. Nice. That's, That's nice. (laughs) <laughs> so you're pretty tough like in terms of physical like you probably well, you know uh, at least against a wooden board or two sure <laughs> <laughs> oh okay that's an interesting part of you to share um yeah so what are what are the things that you do now um apart from that that you do once in a while like what what else do you do to when you're not working or you're not being paid to do that um, Apart from the training right that you're now, doing with uh, bioinformatics. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of it is just like decompression time with the kids. So, you know, playing video games hmm. or watching TV hmm. or falling asleep on the couch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, I, I like to be like active but then outside of being active in an exercise way i i tend to be a homebody um Mm -hmm. so i'll travel when i need to but i don't necessarily you know do it for fun so -hmm. to speak Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean i'll play sims 4 with the kids or they have minecraft servers um that we build and you know get people on and sometimes hack on Mm -hmm. um my husband has a PlayStation, so sometimes he'll play, you know, Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption or everyone right now is waiting for this new game called Stray, which mm-hmm. I actually think is out right now, like literally just dropped today or Wednesday. Oh. So I got to go look into that. Oh, but uh, yeah. So those are things that we we kind of do as groups or individuals. Oh, that sounds like a fun family. We have more screens than a normal family does. It's been noted by my kids' friends. Because <laughs> the mom is part of the the whole thing. Like hey, that's so much fun. You're such a fun yeah. mom. I mean, I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I get criticized sometimes by other parents because we don't believe in having screen time limits. Mm. Um, I didn't have any screen time limits growing up, and I turned out fine. Same with my yeah. husband and. So the kids seem to be fine, but yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. Ah, oh, I-, I like that. Is there any other thing that you would like to do or you're starting to do or you don't do as much, but it's something that you enjoy or you would like to, in- to do more? Well, I, I rotate hobbies a lot. Mm-hmm. So like I'll go through phases. I went through a phase where I was big into playing the piano. Mm. Um, and then I went through a phase where I was big into knitting Mm. and now I'm kind of going through the video game phase again. I did that already, Mm. but you know, video games reinvent themselves. So you got to check new things out. Um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll find whatever really captures my interest at that moment and kind of 
become obsessed about it for a little while and drive mm-hmm. everybody crazy. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, right now I would say that it's video games. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Which of these hobbies do you think has helped you um, as like, like which of the, of the hobbies do you like, if you don't do them, then you you can't function really or you're not a hundred percent with your work definitely tying into the exercise Mm -hmm. um it doesn't necessarily have to be triathlons or you know taekwondo Mm -hmm. lately because of my body and time it's becoming more yoga or tai chi um, you know, instead of hitting the wooden tree, I'm going to hit the air. Mm. But, um, you know, I, I find that if I don't have personal time that way, mm. um, preferably where I can up my energy and, and try to overcome a challenge, mm. that I start to feel defeatist, um, almost like imposter syndrome in my career. Mm-hmm. And that is just not productive. Yeah. So they give, they give, they help you. You, you're, you're telling me that those activities like exercises and such like things, they help you with the imposter syndrome. Yes, they give me confidence and they ground me. They allow me to release nervous energy. Wow, that's a good tip. I've never heard of that one. Wow, I like that. Okay, I didn't, <laughs> I honestly, I honestly didn't know, like, if you want to deal with imposter syndrome, you should do something else, like exercise, that, I don't know, it's, I think it gives you a sense of achievement, right? Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah then, you, oh, I love that. Okay, that's a good tip for myself. Um, we've had a very, um, I, I think, uh, good conversation, uh, pretty i I didn't think you you thought it would be this long (laughs) (laughs) well you got me talking (laughs) yeah um so i'm just wondering is there anything that you would you would have wanted to talk about but we didn't talk about it or is there a question that you uh you hoped that i would ask and i didn't ask or is there something you want you just want to put out there in the public domain that you you wanted a space to talk about it no, just... honestly, I think you've done such a thorough job here that uh, there's not too much left to say that I can think about. Oh, okay, great. Of course, come this time next year, I'm sure I'll have plenty more. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm imagining. I, I I hope the the NGO thing works the, for the bioinformatics. Like, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a bit attached to that one. <laughs> I hope that um, that that goes well. Um, we've we've come to the end of our conversation, and I was just wondering, how do you feel after having this whole conversation? Well, I guess it would be rather cliche if I said I feel vulnerable, considering the name of your <laughs> podcast. Um, yeah. but given the other podcasts that I've done, this one has been by far the most thorough Mm. and I've probably shared more stories here than I should have. (laughs) So, um, you definitely earned your name. I commend you on that. 